So I have fat cats. Okay. Currently, there are six cats running around at my house. Uh, four are permanent, still? temporary. Oh uh, we're still trying to get rid of the two fosters that we've adopted, but it's hard to feed them. And so the solution we've come up with is just free feeding. And unfortunately, the cats don't know their own limits and have um, got a little round around the edges in recent months. So our solution was a maze feeder. And a maze feeder is like a cat bowl, but it has like raised outlines within the bowl itself, kind of like a maze that separates the food into silos and prevents a cat being able to like stick their face in and eat as much as they want. They actually have to like scoop some out and like navigate it in order to get, you know, to the food. And I believe we've solved the chunky cats eating too much problem, but now we're into the child abuse problem. And I'm concerned that someone's going to report me to CPS, Cat Protective Services. Because now every hour on the hour, as I go about my day, the cats run up to me in the house and are like, Father, we're so hungry. What have you done to us? (laughs) And I'm like, there's food in your bowl. And they're like, but it's hard to get to. Can you overfill it a little so we can just eat off the top? I'm like, no, no, use your hands. Come on, come on, do some work. You know, you guys used to be predators. And they're like, we're going to report you to the government. So anyways, listeners, if you were wondering which one of the guy family members of this podcast would be canceled first, the answer is probably going to be me. The cats are going to report me to CPS, Cat Protective Services. I'm going to be arrested for cat endangerment. And um, that'll be the end of this podcast, I guess, unless I could do it in prison. Kind of like how Warren Jeffs was doing his sermons from prison. I don't know who that is. He's that FLDS uh, cult leader who had like a hundred wives in uh, southern Utah, northern mm. Arizona, somewhere in there. Yeah, and then he got taken away, and but the, he was still he was considered like the prophet of his cult, and so he would do sermons over the phone. I see. I'm reminded of those those hacky stand up comics back in the day who'd you know in jokes and they're like take my wife please, and it, there's just a hundred women being like take our husband please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's essentially what happened. back to I Will Know and Date These Guys. It's a podcast where Joel changes the intro each and every time. Uh, I am Joel Guy. I'm Naomi Guy. And we discuss it all. Sex, dating, relationships, a lot of books, some movies. We interview some people. Man, we're just a, a powerhouse, Naomi. A powerhouse that unfortunately Joel cannot channel into his resume because this has nothing to do with the actual work he is paid to do on a daily basis. Maybe you'll be able to channel it on your resume. I do. I do it often, too. And everyone's like, that's such a selling point. I'm like, yeah, it really is. And then they listen to it and they're like, oh. (laughs) Damn. You know, uh, another anecdote, Naomi, a friend of the show, RJ, and I used to work on a solar powered cooler project when we were in college. And the idea was that if you had a solar powered cooler, it would allow farmers in rural parts of um, India and Asia to uh, transport their produce to market. Um, and one you know, anecdote we would constantly pull out is that India is actually the world's largest producer of bananas, but because they have such poor refrigeration, they're unable to bring practically any of their bananas to the international market. Um, now, RJ obtained both a bachelor's and I believe a master's in engineering uh, while he was in college. But the only thing recruiters wanted to hear about was our failed startup, the banana solar-powered cooler. And that was the thing that landed him a bunch of internships as well as jobs. And I keep asking him where my residuals are, because I'm the one who started this concept. And I'm the one who, you know, got him these these interviews. But such is life. I think you should have come up with a better name for it. Uh, The banana cooler, you know, short to the point. Excuse me. It was called Miracle Vehicle. We had a great name. Um, I just don't think it effectively gets the whole picture in the name. Yeah, that's my only thing. Okay. Uh, Naomi, we have a lot to discuss today. But before we do, as always, we have a drink to try. 
Um, I have more drinks that I have purchased at the international market nearest to me. I'm trying today Yeos, Y-E-O-S, uh, lychee drink with lychee juice. It's pretty much water, sugar, and lychee juice. And I like lychees. So I freaking love good. lychees. Yeah, it's fine. It kind of tastes like that liquid you get in canned lychees, just like the juice that they sit in. There's a difference between fresh lychees and canned lychees, and there's a difference yeah. between the taste of a canned lychee and the juice that it sits in, but it's fine. It's refreshing. It's different. Um, I wouldn't buy it again, but that's more of because there's other amazing drinks on the market. This isn't bad. It's just not memorable. Okay. Well, yeah. I would love to introduce our topic of the day. We are discussing kink, which I'm very excited about because we haven't discussed very many like sexual education topics recently. And I'm very excited because this is near and dear to my heart. Want to be sexual educator right here. And um, I am running this episode. So, Joel, I should note ask one you. thing here. Go ahead. Um, employers. I, I didn't do any research for this episode, so you can't use this against me if you come across this episode when, like, looking up Joel Guy and whether or not he should be hired to the firm. Uh, look up all the incredible interviews I did with public figures um, or my uh, my movie reviews. Not all the movie reviews, just the, uh, like, Love Actually one. Yeah, that should be fine. Um, but yeah, th- this cannot be a black mark against me. Um this is not something that I endorse in any way, shape, or form. I've never had sex. I don't know what sex is. I'm pure and virginal, a being made out of light. I, I am surrounded by heavenly ether. Uh, you'll, you'll know it as soon as I step into that interview room with you. Sorry, continue, Naomi. So, Joel, I need to ask you, what do you think kink is? Oh, boy. The lack of research that I've done is really going to come back to bite me in this episode. Um... I think there is an idea in our culture of quote unquote normal sex. And that is perpetuated through both the sex education limited that it is that's available across the country and um, the, the porn, the the commonly accessible porn and as well as, you know, what movies depict uh, often Uh, there's this, you know, whole thing we can talk about with the MPAA, the motion picture association uh, and what, you know, they allow on screen. Uh, Cunnilingus, I believe is still banned. If you want your movie to not get an X rating, you can't have anything like that in your movies. I think blowjobs are okay. Anyways, um, basically we have this idea of what normal sex is in our culture and kink is anything that deviates from that. Um, I think that's probably a little reductionist, but in my mind, like things that are kinky are things that are not like missionary sex for the purpose of recreation, procreation, not recreation. Whoa, I got that wrong. Um, I should caveat this here where similar to IQ test results changing every year, like the population is getting smarter. So like they have to change like the ranges and like what questions are used. Um, It's my belief that kink changes over time. And as certain things become super popular, like, you know, anal sex rising in popularity on like porn sites, they become less taboo to the population and thus less kinky. They're more seen as like socially acceptable. Am I in anywhere in the, the ballpark? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I'm going to add in my like understanding of kink, um, which is basically like my I feel like my perception of what is considered normal and non kinky is like missionary sex or like awkward doggy style that you have like during a one night stand where it's like kind of tender, kind of rough. You don't know each other, you know, that's what I consider Whoa. like normal unkinky sex. Um, and then everything else that deviates from that um, is, is kinky. Um, and I say that because um, I, I also agree with you in that sense that, you know, as things, as activities become more popular, they become more normalized. Like you mentioned anal sex. That's a great example um, of like normal, no, more normalized um, sex. Um, but yeah, I think that um, we have a lot to learn in this episode. Are we going to discuss Fifty Shades of Grey at all? No, we are not going to discuss okay. that because I think that this is my understanding of that movie and this is my opinion. Just my opinion. I don't like that movie for a lot of reasons. And I think that a real reason why I don't like that movie is one, um, the storyline was crap, but two, 
the main reason why he is into kink is because of his trauma. And I think that that's a really bad way of understanding kink. Um, he got into it because he was groomed by his mom's older friend. And that's how he like got into the act of like kink and stuff like that. And I don't think that that's a good perception to give the audience um, of a movie that kink only comes from and your liking of kink only comes from trauma. I think I, I that's what I don't like about it. I'm going to jump into what is kink, the definition. I'm taking this from What is Kink by John Han uh, John Hancock by Justin Hancock. <laughs> One of our founding fathers wrote this article. So kink is a set of pleasurable activities that people choose to do together that in other contexts are not pleasurable uh, not pleasurable or useful. It is also often called BDSM. BDSM is now uh, just a general term which applies to activities or fantasies or scenes that involve a consensual exchange of power, where it's agreed that one person has more power over another person for a set period of time. Um, what these people do is agreed in advance, and it might involve physical control, sensory deprivation, restraint, pain, humiliation, being told off, etc., all of the things, uh, all the kinds of things that might usually be deeper, uh, deeply unpleasant, but um, like in kink, they can feel really good. Sorry, back up a second. Yeah. Can we talk about the abbreviation BDSM? Yeah. A BDSM is one of those phrases that's like thrown around a lot. And I think a lot of people don't have a general idea, but like don't know what it actually stands for. Um, it's interesting because it's actually a combination of three separate abbreviations, BD, DS, and SM. So BD stands for bondage and discipline. So it's like, you know, tying people up and, you know, whipping them for pleasure. Um, DS dominance and submission. So having, you know, kinky relationships where, you know, one person has majority of the power or one person is, you know, in a subservient role. Um, and then SM sadism, and masochism. So, you know, uh, using pain for pleasure, doing, you know, things involving inflicting pain or receiving pain um, as part of your, you know, sexual activities. So BDSM, BDDSSM, uh, BDSM obviously is a little bit easier than BDDSSSM. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's commonly thrown around, but I think a lot of people don't really discuss like what's all bound up in that. Literally bound. That was what I was intending. Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> so just to continue, there's a lot of overlap with rough sex, but kink is more about creating a scene or a vibe where people play with power. Uh, rough sex is just doing various rough sexual activities together. Um, and then we discussed like normal. It's also uh, like normal sex. It's also described as vanilla. And uh, these, this term is used to describe things that are not kink or kinky. Um, it's not to mean that these things are boring or worse than kink. It's just not kink. So when I say, you know, vanilla versus kinky, that's what I mean. Uh, sometimes kink is usually really broadly to used really broadly to define anything that isn't penis and vagina sex in a monogamous loving relationship. That feels very heteronormative. Yeah, that's what I don't really like is that like, I feel like that shouldn't be a part of like, you know, because then it's like, okay, you can't have vanilla sex if you're in a uh, like a homosexual relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I've always said that. Yeah, happy pride, people. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, a lot of people like kink or have like kinky thoughts, desires, or fantasies. Perhaps, perhaps most people at one time or another in their life have you know had these thoughts. Remember, kink is a huge range of things with different levels of intens intensity. Agreeing to be tickled or blindfolded, held down, have pain, pain, pain inflicted, um, be handcuffed, being told off, called the name, be degraded, chased, or even be held captive are just some of the thousands and thousands of things people can do or fantasize about. So I'm sorry, that rich guy who pays me money for me to like be hunted down on his estate every weekend, that, that that's actually kink. That's not just a that, that not just a part time job I have. Do you do it to get off? Someone does. <laughs> then yes, that's kink. Okay. Where's the closest island to you? That's what I'm trying to think about right now. Oh, no, I said a state, not island. Oh, okay, um, okay, it's, okay. it's, you know, like a large desert preserve. You know, there's mountains, there's 
cacti I can hide behind if I like, you know, suck in my gut and, you know, hold my arms together or, you know, I, I'm like in a pose similar to a cactus, <laughs> like one arm up and one arm down, dressed all in green, hoping that no one notices me. And unlike like English estates where they have like foxes hunting you down here, they have trained coyotes. I think that this would be an honestly a really great um, storyline for the next Knives Out movie. Um, that's just my POV. That's what I'm going to say. Daniel Craig dressed in a fox costume. I love it. He's yep. down. He's yeah. having the time of his life now that he's no longer shackled to James Bond. <laughs> what is up with you and making all these sexual innuendos when we're having uh, having a conversation about cake? When I said James Bond, it wasn't supposed to be like James Bond. You're, no, you're you, said you said shackled. You said shackled. I mean, in fairness, like, look, maybe maybe that's where my brain is right now. But in our culture, we have a lot of expressions about, like, subjection, being, you know, in servitude, being, you know, confined to certain roles. Um, I mean, like, I think often it's not really thought about. But, like, yeah, there's a lot of terminology about, like, slavery, which, you know, probably stems from the English language and the Englishes and Americans, you know, broad associations with slavery throughout our history. Uh, just not something to think about, you know, just just don't worry your head over it. It uh, probably for the best if we don't reflect upon that. Moving on. King can be playful, funny, joyous, intense, thrilling, scary in a good way and deeply intimate. It can also be a safe way for people to feel very intense feelings and experiences. They might laugh, cry, growl, zone out, feel helpless, all powerful or in a pleasurable pain. People who do sports or rock climbing or parkour, watch scary films or go to the theme parks or go to loud music gigs, gigs often report that they feel some of these same sensations. So what I honestly want to like talk about is the difference between kink and um, uh, sex, and then also talk about um, like who it's for and uh, how to go about having the conversations about how to like initiate um, if you you want to like start having a more kinky relation sexual relationship with your partner or partners, and um, go from there. So kink is not for everyone, obviously, like the, some of these things don't sound fun um, to me. So let's just start with that. Some people only do things with their partners that are very mutual with very small amounts of exchanges of power. Um, and that's completely fine. And then there's uh, one of the issues that we have in uh, the, this culture is that people think that we should always be extending ourselves and pushing ourselves to do more. And I think that this is a really good point in the sense that if you are not completely on board with it, or let's just say you've tried it and you don't like it, do not push yourself to do something that you are uncomfortable doing in a vulnerable state, like having sex with someone else. If that is something that you don't want to do, don't push yourself to do that just because your partner wants to do those things. And I think that um, a lot of people do that in order to satisfy their partner or, um, you know, try and satisfy something within themselves sometimes. And something that you need to understand is, you know, consent is a really big part of kink culture. Um, like in the definition, we discussed the, the fact that this needs to be a completely consensual experience between two people or two or more people. And so if it's not completely consensual, there's a lack of trust there. And that kink is no longer kink. It's just scary sometimes. Joel, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I, I, I just want to build off your comment. Um, I spend a, a decent amount of time, you know, on the R2X chromosome subreddit, uh, getting episode ideas and hearing about books people have read that either make them concerned or give them cause for hope. Um, and, you know, some of that trickles down into this podcast. I'm not going to pretend to uh, be a woman. I will not pretend to have the intimate understanding of the world that a lot of women have that is quite distinct from my own male centered view. But, you know, I, I try to be um, cognizant of the concerns and issues that they bring up in conversations with their peers. Uh, one thing that I see very commonly brought up is women who are complaining that a new partner that they have. And this is can be true for women in queer relationships or women in heterosexual relationships, but I predominantly see it in heterosexual ones. Um, they'll mention something like, oh, I tried anal with an ex-partner. And their new partner 
will get all offended when they say, oh, I don't want to do anal anymore. And there's this understanding that I think some people have where in a relationship, the more you love somebody, the more sexual favors you give them. Like if you've like formed like a like a tight exclusive relationship, like you level up similar to a video game and you unlock new dialogue options with your partner. And one of them is like additional sexual fantasies, you know, oh, now I'll dress in the anime girl cosplay or whatever in the bedroom. Um, And that's not accurate. Uh, It is it is totally valid if you're in a relationship and you try something like anal with an ex partner and then decide I don't want to do that anymore. It was something to check off my list or potentially something I was pressured into. I am no longer comfortable doing that because I did not find it pleasurable. And you need to accept that your partner can set those boundaries. That's, you know, part of being in a relationship is accepting that you are engaged to another human being who has independent thoughts and desires and the ability to set up barriers and boundaries. Um, So, yeah, like, I I think it's really important to underscore that just this idea that like kink is something based off consent. Um, You do things like dominance and submission with another person, theoretically, because you like them, because you find it like sexually pleasurable, you both get something out of it. It's not like, well, I want to like, like whip you, I want to like put you in a cage or something because I don't like you. That that feels like there's a problem in the relationship and if your partner is like hey i i really 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 want you to do these things that you're not at all comfortable with that may be a deal breaker for the relationship because ideally any person that you're spending a lot of time with that you want to be close and comfortable with is going to respect your boundaries is going to understand that there are certain things that are off limit so uh, yeah consent's important but also never feel like you owe anybody anything sex is not this hierarchy of dialogue options sex is not this you know long list of acts that slowly unlock as your partner proves themselves to you sex is something you do for pleasure sex is something you do because you want to have fun because you want to learn something new about yourself i think that's a really great way of putting it i know that in the past i've really struggled with that for a variety of reasons and um i think something that really helped me and my partner was um reading the book sex talks which we actually have a couple of episodes about on our podcast uh shamelessly plugging our podcast right now yes um, but if it. you want to if you want to pick up a copy of it it's called sex talks um i think it's like five Vanessa conversations yeah. yeah that will transform your sex life i don't know um but i really enjoyed it i thought it was a really great way of like bringing up she like speaks on how to bring up conversations how to introduce subjects like this um but Pertaining more to this episode, I want to discuss how you like get into like these conversations in the first place. So um, before you can do any kink activities with anyone else, it's really important to talk about things that you do want to do, uh, what you might want to do, but are unsure about or things that you definitely don't want to do. Um, and, and maybe honestly just make a list, like things that you are interested in, things that you definitely would say no to, um, things of that nature. Um, so think of all the different kinds of kinky activities you could do, make a list. Um, and I think it's a really good idea to come up with your own, um, sort of understanding of what these things are and make sure that when you are communicating this to the partner or partners that you're doing these activities with, that everyone is on the same page. Cause one person's restraint might be a totally different un- person's understanding of restraint so i think that that's a good conversation starter yeah uh one one thing that we've discussed before on this podcast is there's a lot of apps and websites that are available if you want to you know have that difficult conversation with the partner without running down a list and being like so you into sex toys okay that's a maybe okay you're into uh butt plugs okay that's a yes okay right that, that's awkward that's weird you know whether that's with a new partner or a long-term partner it's always going to be a difficult conversation so we have discussed some of the apps that are available if you want to like each individually do that and then it shares results and only compares the stuff that like you have in common with your partner i think the one we've recommended before is we should try it which is an online questionnaire but i just googled it trying to figure out what the name was and it looks like there's two new apps uh spicer not spicier spicer 
the Sean Spicer sex app. Uh, Spicer is, I guess, an app that allows you to do the same thing. It runs you through a list, yes, no, maybe, and compares your answers. And then Intimately Us is a similar one. Couples can create lists of sexual preferences, discuss fantasies, and create a bucket list of sexual activities. It also does things like offering daily challenges and articles from sex experts. So, like, if both of you into it, but either of you, like, want to make the first move, having, you know, kind of this independent thing send you phone notifications, like, time to flash a stranger. Don't do that. That's not consensual. Time to... Uh, walk naked outside and flash. No, boy, I'm really having difficulty with this. You get the idea. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one way of doing it. Another way is just sitting down with your partner, having an open, honest conversation. You know, hey, I'm super into this. Are you into it? Skill of one to ten, or you know, things that things. But like that. as we talked about in the Vanessa Marin episodes, and she underscores, it's difficult to create that safe space. That's not to say it can't be done, but like there are reasons people don't have these conversations. There are reasons people never discuss this. There's reasons couples, you know, go for years with dead bedrooms before they go to sex therapy. They're difficult conversations to have. So don't feel like you need to have the force of will and the strength and the the ability to you know initiate these tough talks. There are tools out there. Listen to our episodes. Episodes, read the book there's there's all sorts of resources for you and i'm sure naomi's going to share some more yeah i think um honestly a really great way of doing things is like like you mentioned like there are apps out there you can have these conversations you can like you know have this conversation with a the therapist in between you guys things like that but i also would like to mention that sometimes when you are in a sexual situation and i'm just gonna kind of foreshadow on the next topic um Sometimes when you're in these situations and you haven't been in them before and they make you feel unsafe and you don't know how to like understand the feeling that you're feeling, um, you kind of start to have like a trauma response to things like this. And so I think that coming up with, you know, some safe words or, um, trying to understand, um, Make sure that your partner is fully aware of what's going on and never get to the point where you don't feel safe in that situation. Unless you're into that, then go ahead, do that. But, um, Joel, I love you so much, but people out there are really into some weird shit. I'm not saying that's weird. I'm just saying it's weird for me. I'm not going to kink shame you. I'm not going to yuck, yuck your yum, whatever. But what I'm trying to say is that some people are into that. Do not give me that face keep going (laughs) just as with sex it's important to remember that consent needs to be ongoing and like i mentioned the scene can be very quickly go from consensual to non-consensual so talk about what kinds of communication strategies you are going to rely on during a kink scene remember that some of these might not be available to you for example you can't establish eye contact with someone who is blindfolded someone might not be able to speak if you have like rolled up a pair of socks in their mouth clean or dirty your choice So you are going to have to talk about how you're going to continue this ongoing communication. Um, So the next thing that I want to discuss is sexual aftercare. And this is something that I find extremely underrated in so many different parts of like so many of my friends are like, what the fuck is aftercare? Okay. Imagine this. You just had sex with a partner. You're doing it. You had a good time. You cuddle them. That is aftercare. You give them a towel to clean themselves off. Aftercare. You watch a movie. Aftercare. You bring your partner food in bed or your partner brings you food in bed. Aftercare. Heck, that can be part of the sex. Some people are into that. (laughs) Yes, yes. Cooking dinner afterward or cooking a meal afterwards, taking a shower together. Aftercare is extremely important in kinky situations. I cannot stress this enough. Just like when you have a fight, that adrenaline is up. You have like a, uh, sometimes you don't feel like yourself. You need to connect back with your partner. And aftercare is a really great way of doing this. Um, It can help you and your partner feel cared for, respected, or relaxed after sex. It can also help you feel um, like what you did was special and create a stronger connection. And aftercare can be practiced in many ways, like I mentioned, such as talking about the experience, cuddling, or taking a shower. So aftercare continues the emotional bond in a way that allows the body and the brain to return to normal without feeling sadness or negativity. I'm going to give an example. Some people that grew up religious 
feel a certain amount of guilt after they have sex that is outside of marriage. And sometimes even in marriage, they find that sex is a very um, guilt-filled activity. And so having that aftercare with your partner like that is a really great way of helping them not feel guilty after having sex with you or your partners um, and helps them bring back to their like normal thoughts and their like normalcy and their homeostasis. Um, I will not ever say that aftercare is not important. Aftercare is so freaking important. I will preach that to the day I die. That's all I have to say on that. Sorry, if I can just cut in here for a second. What if you're into not having aftercare? No. Um, I'm thinking, Naomi, have you seen the movie My Dinner with Andre? No, I have not. Okay. Uh, My Dinner with Andre is a film from late 70s, early 80s. I don't know. Um, It is a very simple film. It might even have been based off a stage play, but it is two guys talking over dinner. It is the like cheapest imaginable movie where one guy gets invited by his friend to dinner at a restaurant and learns what his friend has been up to over the last few years. And they just have this like wonderful dialogue back and forth about life and existence and like their separate experiences and worldviews. And then he goes home and and that's it. It's just an hour and a half. It's great. Um, And I kind of think one of the reasons people like underestimate the importance slash value of aftercare is as we talked about before, like porn and media doesn't really show it right. Like in movies, when you have sex scenes for the most part, it's to establish like an intimate connection between characters. It's shorthand for like a strong emotional attachment. Oh, these people have had sex. Therefore, you know, they're now in a relationship or therefore they now have some kind of, you know, chemistry. And the movies don't have the time to, you know, have two to three minutes afterwards of people just lying in bed. If you have two people lying in bed frequently and notice this, pay attention to this. It's middle-aged couples who are lying in bed next to each other, not having sex. And the, like the point of the scene is, Oh my God, look how they've gotten. There's no intimacy in this relationship anymore. They're just two old people who, who don't love each other. And a plot point in the movie is like getting back to the point where they feel comfortable, like having sex with one another. My point here is, um, I think we need to write a movie script where two people at the beginning of the film have sex And it's just an hour and a half of aftercare of them just, you know, lying together and cuddling and talking about their feelings. And then it cuts and they're in like the kitchen making each other grilled cheese sandwiches. And oh, my God, one of them burned the grilled cheese sandwich. How silly. So they have to go to the store, Naomi, because they're out of bread and they're like bonding over the store and in the car ride and whatnot. They're just having the time of their lives. Maybe one of them, you know, gives some change to a homeless dude. They get to the store. They buy their bread. They, you know, have a quick little, you know, sidebar of the cashier. They go home. (gasps) Back at it for round two. Brilliant. And then they do more aftercare, Naomi. And then they fall asleep snuggling. And that's it. That's the movie. Just my bang fest with Andre. Andrea. Um, <laughs> look, we'll workshop the title. But no, I, I think it's important that, you know, you, you have more media express the importance of aftercare. And unfortunately, like the way we've constructed media is like where there's just not the time to explore that in detail. There's just, you know, not the ability to dedicate a chunk of a film to, you know, that topic. Like think about the movie, anybody, but you, I think there's two sex scenes in that film. And in both of those scenes, they don't do any form of aftercare. I might be misremembering. I think the, in the first part of the movie, when they initially meet, they might've just talked all night. Uh, But in the second part, like one of them sneaks out of the bedroom after they have sex, after they get stranded on the, the pier thingy in the Harbor. And I'm like, man, so many other problems problems could have been solved if they just like were honest and open and we're talking to each other in the afterglow so what i'm saying is once again naomi we have an amazing film idea that if we just stop doing this podcast and dedicate a similar amount of research and production time each week to working on that script we could be millionaires by the end the end so of what true. i don't know the end of america probably which is coming <laughs> soon this summer <laughs> not this summer next this so. fall <laughs> yeah <laughs> Summer 2026. 2026. 2026. No, I think that's a really great understanding of like, like obviously sneaking out like after 
you know, having sex in a movie, like, just creates more drama. So, obviously, like, they can't sit down and communicate. That's against the rules, Joel. But, no, whoa, whoa, I whoa, whoa, whoa. I would, I would back up. Um, I would say it's laziness on the part of Hollywood writers. And I think that almost stems from Hollywood writers. I don't want to call them out, but there's like a lack of like emotional experience and like sexual intimacy for a lot of writers. They just don't have the ability to portray like what a healthy communicative relationship is on screen. And I would argue the more interesting thing is the people have sex and then while they're talking, in the afterglow something between them comes up that's like super important it's like a contradiction of their worldviews. it's not like oh i misheard something it's like you're cuddling this guy and he's like so uh trump's pretty cool right or you know oh can you believe people still think birds are real right i'm like and i'm not saying it's that i'm just saying like you can have an honest conversation with somebody where like a character flaw or like some idea that biases you against them is revealed and the fact that more movies don't take advantage of that, the conversation time that a lot of normal couples engage in after sex is just baffling to me. Come on, Hollywood. I don't know why you keep describing Aftercare's Afterglow, but I love it because it's like the glow of sex afterwards. I really love that. I'm going to start saying that. As, as a pure angelic virginal being, I am always surrounded by glow, right? And I want to project that into the world. So true. The psychology of sexual kink. The word kink has a myriad of associations. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm reading this from theswaddle.com by Rajvi Desai. I just honestly butchered that name. The word kink has a myriad of associations. Leather, spanking, corsets, whips, maybe even a ginger root. While its depiction in popular culture are abundant and eager, they are hardly ever accurate. Fifty Shades of Grey, for example, is the most recent and perhaps the most famous example of kink, specifically bondage or just discipline, dominance, submission, and I'm sorry, I should have just said BDSM, in mainstream pop culture. Except it gets kink wrong. BDSM practitioners have called the movie more vanilla than BDSM or dangerous because of its superficial understanding of violent sex glorifying portrayed without context. The kink sexual preference is a is greatly stigmatized one and the psychology behind it is misunderstood kink is believed to stem out of trauma which is false it's perceived to bastardize the tender idea of making love again false and it's considered freaky and not normal also false understanding how kink develops and what kinky people get out of it are the initial steps toward normalizing an integral aspect of human sexuality kink is defined uh like we mentioned earlier and uh, kink can develop innately in childhood or be adopted later in life. Individuals may gravitate towards ki- uh, kink in two ways. The journey in is either innate or, and realized as a child grows up or an acquired taste later in life from others wanting to explore their sexuality. Children, even before the age of 10, t- can develop initial engagement in kinky behavior, such as wanting to be captured while playing cops and robbers or seeing television shows with superheroes in peril and feeling absorbed by the show. For some, these initial excitements could graduate to exploring these desires with their bodies through fantasizing, seeking out erotic media, masturbating, or exploring material sensations on their bodies. I would like to say, this is not for everyone. This is not how everyone does it. Not every single time that your 10-year-old comes to you and says, hey, let's play cops and robbers, is that child seeking out some sort of fetish. I would like to be very clear about that. Well, I I think it's important because you've already discussed how like this term kink can apply to a lot of things, including sexual acts that don't involve even like stimulation of genitals. And I think, you know, the explanation that was just given there kind of made it make more sense to me because you can have a lot of things to be considered kinky that in no way involve like sexual activity or nude human beings or whatever. And a good example is like financial domination. And I don't get this. This is like something that makes no sense to me. But there are these arrangements often done completely online where someone sends control of their bank account to another individual who then decides like how they can use their money and how much of their money they take out and use for their own personal desires. And like some people get a huge thrill out of not having that control, 
right? And I would almost compare it to like cosplaying, right? It's like being a person that you normally aren't, right? You're stepping from a state where like you're financially comfortable with like a bank account into a state where you're not. And that's exciting. That's thrilling, right? It's like putting on a Halloween costume. And so in the same way, I would say, you know, if a kid, you know, wants to play cops and robbers with you, this in no way is tying it to like a sexual thing. It could be, as you say, but simultaneously, it could just be like, I want to explore a state where I'm not me, right? I want to be a person that I am not. It's a form of pretend, right? It's a form of imagination. It's a way of like thinking about the world in a way you don't normally think. That makes a lot more sense to me. I should, sorry, put in a note here. I was making all sorts of faces when Naomi made the reference to ginger root. You just glossed over that. Do you know what that is referring to? No, please educate. I was thinking ginger root was like some exotic name for like a whip or something. No, I like, no. I knew they were talking like about a ginger lot root. of little things. Yeah. No, they're no. talking about actual ginger root. The yeah. thing they're talking about is a process called figging, where you insert a piece of skinned ginger root into the anus to produce a burning sensation. Um, so ginger root does not react well with your soft tissues. I don't think it can cause damage, but it's very painful. Apparently it was originally used as a form of discipline on slaves in ancient Greece. Um, but yeah, it's basically just a butt plug. The effect reaches its maximum within two to five minutes after insertion, persists for around 30 minutes before gradually easing. Um, and then every time you put in a fresh piece of ginger root, the sensation returns. Uh, so it can be like very, very painful. Again, some people might be into that, but I'm just like, oh God, that seems so bad. Yeah, I feel like putting anything in your anus is painful. Moving That's on. That's probably true. Between the ages of 11 and 14, kids come to terms with their interests. It can involve feeling stigma over their kink interests, feeling generally different, realizing that not all of their peers share their interests, worrying there might be something wrong with them, and sometimes actively engaging in research in order to try to label and understand their interests. Once they realize there might be people like them out there, they can attempt to find others who share their interests through the internet and popular culture. The last stage of kink development includes engaging in kink interests with others, which usually happens after a kinkster surpasses 18. If this identity development doesn't occur early on, it will then it leads to internalized shame, causing anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. Uh, Hughes says uh, he's a sexual psychologist adds that young kinky people often feel like they are freaks sick or evil for entertaining their desires this is mostly due to stigma and silence around kinky behaviors which leads to rampant a rampant pop psychology patho pathologization pathologization of kink in media and the law and the law Studying the identity development of kinky people can help us to better understand how kinky people develop resilience in the face of the world that often thinks of them as, at best, a joke, and at worst, violent criminals are mentally deranged. So, uh, pop psychology pathologies. Path oh boy, I can't even say that word. Uh, basically, <laughs> they're saying because we never discuss kink in popular culture pop psychologists you know psychologists who like write for new york times or the new yorker or like in other publications will treat it as like a mental disorder um or when it is discussed it's you know often treated as a joke not something that like serious people engage with which makes people feel like oh well only children do that only people who aren't adults do that um yeah i mean it's similar to how in, in recent years, there's been more of a focus on, like, the importance of adults having fun, right? There's now, like, whole industries that just appeal to, like, selling Lego sets to adults and whatnot. But there, there's very much been this kind of revival of the idea that, like, all people enjoy play, and there's nothing wrong with, like, the act of play. And I do genuinely mean play, like, video games or Lego sets or tag and, you know, an intramural soccer game as, as an adult. Um, yeah, human beings and many mammals are wired for that. And I say many mammals because I remember reading an article many years ago uh, about a group of researchers who were out in the Arctic. And like, I think it was the Arctic, might have been the Antarctic. I don't remember. Whichever one has polar bears. And a starving polar bear comes over the ridge, like, you know, 100 feet away from them. And they can tell it's starving. It's been a long winter. This polar bear is like very clearly skinny and it starts charging at them. And they have a bunch of like huskies, you know, sled dogs. And the huskies have never seen a polar bear before. And they're like, oh, a friend? And they run over to this polar bear and start like running around him and like chasing him and playing tag with him. And the polar bear reacts in kind. 
even though this polar bear is like clearly worse for wear and like was hyper focused on like eating something all of a sudden some switch just flipped in its brain and it was like oh boy friends to play with and they all were like chasing each other in a circle and so in the same way i think it's really important that we do this like social change and say yeah adults like to enjoy stuff adults don't like being serious people who care about the economy and spreadsheets all day we like occasionally letting our hair down I'm just imagining the polar bear, and that just made me really happy. That's all. I'm picturing James Bond is dressed in a polar bear costume. I was also thinking about this this uh, albino brown bear that I heard about recently that kept being mistaken for a polar bear, and so they kept trying to put him back in the Arctic or Antarctic, whatever, and he didn't belong there, and so they had to relocate him like three or four times because so many people were just like, oh, he doesn't belong here, and so they kept like shipping Aww. him up there. Yeah, you know, on Grinder, my nickname is Albino Brown Bear. I don't know why I said that. Uh, let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Social stigmatization of kink can be a detriment to kinksters' mental health. Let's take an example of age play. One of the most stigmatized kink expressions, as it involves adult dr- adults dressing up slash behaving as babies or toddlers in a sexual situation, it is classified into f f f hebophilia or attraction to older post-pubescent adolescents, hebophilia or attraction to uh, pubescence, pedophilia and attraction to prepubescence and infantophilia, which is often considered a subtype of pedophilia. Used to refer to sexual preference for infants and toddlers usually aged 0 to 3, which uh, some, though some raise it to 5. Um, so a majority of the stigma that ari- that is uh, against age play arises from a conflation of pedophilia with uh, child sexual abuse. The former is a sexual preference, while the latter is an illegal practice that harms minors who cannot consent. In age play, the consenting adult uh, sexual partners act in age different than their own for various reasons. Those who act younger maybe want to be cared for or disciplined or simply play an age that they feel most familiar with. For those who gravitate towards older ages, their instincts might arise from wanting to act as caregivers or protectors of their partner, fulfilling their partner's desire to be disciplined, and a myriad of other reasons. So if if I can cut in here, one thing that kind of helped me understand the attraction of age play, even though, like, from a top-level view, I'm like, doesn't do anything for me, um, is a comment I saw about Japanese pornography. I don't recall. This might have been on like Twitter or Tumblr or Reddit or something. But one can argue that a disproportionate share of like Japanese porn and culture is hyper fixated on high school. And there's like so much pornography out there, you know, hentai and anime. Sorry, I'm not conflating hentai and anime. I'm saying, you know, just a lot of Japanese culture focuses on like high school experiences. Um, including you know a lot of their like sexual content and the comment was like look i'm just you know theorizing here but i think one of the reasons that like japanese men hyper fixate on high school is not because they're all pedophiles but because japanese work culture is so brutal um you leave high school you enter college you start a career and you're suddenly working you know five 12 hour days a week or six days a week nonstop for a career and your boss is in control basically your entire life and you're expected to act in a certain way and you're expected to you know show up at certain times and there's dress codes and requirements and you do that for far too long until you're able to retire and then you know you just kind of like sit at home all day after you retire right and so the idea here is that this focus on like high school is because high school was one of the best parts of japanese people's lives and i don't want to like stereotype and say this is true for all japan obviously experiences can vary but there is obviously a problem with like salary man culture in japan um and and I, i think it makes sense to some extent that like people would derive pleasure whether enjoying anime or sexual pleasure enjoying the idea of like high school sexual fantasies just because their current life is so dreary and dull and depressing in comparison and so i think in the same way age play could very much be an opportunity of escapism where it's like i have all these problems as an adult 
I'm a functioning human being adult, right? I have a family to take care of. I have six kids. They're all relying upon me. I hate working my terrible job. And so it's nice having a time where you can slip into this other identity, a simpler time where you probably felt a lot better about yourself, whether that be, you know, pretending to be an infant, pretending to be a five-year-old, pretending to be, you know, a 10-year-old, a teenager, whatever. Um, and, and so, look, I'm not saying that that's a perfect explanation that covers everyone, but I just think that's a like perspective that helped me understand why people might think in that way. And I think you can apply that to a lot of weird sexual fetishes. So a lot of people will be like, oh, I think that's you know, gross and deviant. What's that? It's probably a form of escapism in some form, right? Like, why would you have sex if not a form of escapism, right? Like, why would you want sex and only add to your struggles and frustrations and whatnot? It feels like a really good opportunity to de-stress most of the time. Yeah, I think that's a really good perspective. Um, David Ortman, who's a sexual therapist, like talks a lot about how he's been treating people for 14 years. And the main reason they seek therapy is to be seen, to be heard and to recover from shame or discover how to have sexual pleasure without harming themselves or others. And it's important to understand that age play is a form of role playing in which an individual acts or treats other another as if they are a different age, sexual or non-sexually. The most important thing to remember is that it involves consent of, from all parties. And there needs to be more research into the kink origins of age play, which has historically been difficult to accomplish owing to the silence of the community that doesn't trust outsiders easily. Um, normalizing the kink for the person and helping them to find a like-minded or accepting partner is most important. Uh, so writes Rhonda Lipscomb, who's a certified sex therapist. And with those steps come self self acceptance, less anger, better sleeping habits, and better relationships pattern patterns for those involved. The supportive environment of kink uh, can be a haven for those with non normative desires and bodies. For dominant submissive relationships in BDSM, the underlying psychological motivations are more clearly researched. For tops in kink speak, tops are those who adopt a dominant role for a particular sexual encounter as compared to doms who gravitate towards dominance more frequently. Uh, I can determine what happens next. I can be independent. I can feel cherished. Make up some of those erotic motivations. For bottoms in kink speak, bottoms are those who adopt a submissive role for a particular sexual encounter as compared to subs um, who prefer submissive sexual identities more frequently. They include, I can hold extreme focus. I can feel safe. I can feel cherished. I don't have to make decisions. I don't have to worry about my partner's reactions. And for both tops and bottoms, openness, exploration, trustworthiness, communication, humor, playfulness, laughter, and fun, and sensual experiences are prioritized for themselves and their partners. In tops, their bottoms partners require trustworthiness, warmth, and caring, ability to read a partner, confidence, and strength of character, knowledge, and skill. In bottoms, the top needs self-knowledgeable, rebellious qualities such as bratty, expressiveness, and surrendering to power. In addition to understanding the motivations of sexual players, it is also important to destroy the myth that BDSM encourages unwelcome violence against partners. In sexual play that involves intense sensation, sometimes pain, for example, the players seek to achieve pleasure and challenge their boundaries. Um, and it's not something that is meant to be a painful experience in the sense that a non-consensual painful experience. When you're consenting in kink, um, it's uh, mainly thought that like, oh, this is happening to somebody else and they're like shaking and they're not okay. But this is something that needs to be communicated properly for one. And it also, you need to understand that these are completely consensual experiences that both parties need to be fully knowledgeable about. If I can cut in here, I, I think once again, I want to underscore the importance of communication because how someone reacts in the moment can be very variable, even if, you know, they're having fun and enjoying themselves. And I think, again, kind of an analogy that helped me understand it is sometimes cats lick rabbits. That's not, that, that, that's a real thing that occurs. There's photos you can find of like cats grooming bunnies on the internet. Cats lick things to establish dominance, right? You are my property. I am licking you to make you clean, right? Rabbits 
get licked to establish dominance. If a rabbit is being licked by another rabbit, it is because it is like kind of the the leader, right? It's the one that, you know, gets others to clean it. It doesn't have to do it itself. And so both of them in that activity are establishing dominance in their own respective ways, even though it looks like, you know, the cat's the only one that's like asserting itself. And so in the same way, I would say two people can both be feeling dominant. Two people could both be feeling submissive and the reactions might not be what, like what we expect. They might be, you know, totally off base and, you know, someone who, and this is important. It goes both ways. Someone who feel, who looks like they're very upset might be completely happy. That's communication. And someone who's very happy and expressing pleasure might be very upset. That's communication, right? And so it's important at all steps of this process to be engaging with your partner, making sure no one's shouting any safe words, making sure that they're 100% okay, because your reaction in the moment might not be the reaction that people expect if they think that you're in danger, if you're not enjoying yourself, if you feel highly uncomfortable. I think a really good example of this is like um, outside of the sexual context is some people laugh um, at bad moments, like it, in in non um, n- not mm. the best moments. So like if they hear someone dies or something like that, they laugh. And I think that that's a really great way of um, understanding that not everyone has the same reactions and not expected reactions. And so you really have to be mindful of the person that you are are. Um, stepping into these experiences with that not everyone maybe even communicate that like hey do you have any you know weird expressions of your um pain or anything like that so that's a good point i like that point kink can also help build an inclusive environment for queer folks um and it's a way that um there's like a identity development for kink in the way that in which kids can uh realize their queer identities The emotional stages are similar, including dealing with stigma and making positive associations with those realizations. BDSM as a sexual orientation is a popular hypothesis explained as attraction towards specific activities or towards a role. Um, Be in it, the be it the uh, individuals or their partners. Everyone has sexual orientation in regard to gender, gender, because uh, I was about to say ginger uh regard to gender because that's how we define sexual orientation and everyone has sexual orientation in regard to power too and if we define it as submissive dominant switch or vanilla kink can also help marginalized communities feel more comfortable in their own skin for trans people their relationships with their bodies are colored by dysphoria awkwardness and trauma for a group whose bodies and existence are unabashedly questioned fetishized or who are made to feel unwelcome in societal institutions consent is a sexual scenario um consent in a sexual scenario holds utmost important i just would like to wrap up this episode by saying uh that we are not yucking anyone's yum we would like that uh to for everyone to explore their sexuality in a variety of different ways um, King can be a vehicle for people to embrace their vulnerability, maintain intimate bonds with various people, and learn to communicate and negotiate varied sexual preferences in a non-judgmental way. And kink is not weird or something to sensationalize. And when we achieve a greater understanding of non-normative sexual practices, we normalize identities that are otherwise marginalized and who knows, might be even learn a thing or two instead, both in and out of sex. So that is part one of our kink series. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, Joel, any last thoughts? No, I mean, I I think we underscored the important things. Um, Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I don't... I I, I saw a joke somewhere that, like, you know it's a progressive podcast if half the content is just adding caveats to every statement you say. And, and, And I think that is kind of true in this episode where... This feels obvious, but it's important to underscore. Not everything that people find sexually desirable is going to be found sexually desirable by people around you, right? It's very likely that you're going to have sexual interests and proclivities as an individual that are different than your peers. 
And you might find a partner who shares a lot of your interests, um, and that's great, and that's awesome, and we wish you the best. But yeah, it's it's not crazy to say that there is going to be a lot of things that you might want to you know discuss openly with your peers that they're just like, I don't get it. It's weird. It's icky. It's gross. And that's kind of just the nature of sexuality. Um, I, I don't think anyone, you know, should, should feel bad if, you know, anything we said on this podcast, we're like, I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's weird. Yeah. We're, we're not trying to say that you're like a bad person or different or anything like that. Hopefully, you know, that never was the implication. I think what we're simply trying to say is like, obviously there are variations in sexuality, sexuality in so many different ways, in so many different dimensions is a spectrum. There's going to be things people find more desirable and less desirable. And you may be part of some incredibly niche subculture that we just don't get at all. And that's totally cool. You do you in a consensual manner. We're not here to, you know, harsh your vibe. We are here to give you the tools and resources to get your vibe on. However that is, wherever that is with people that you find desirable. Woo! Yes, I second that statement. Um, if you would like for us to talk about anything specific, email us at datetheseguys at gmail.com. We would love to take your suggestions. Um, if you I'm really call concerned in, that people are going to like send us like episode ideas. And we'll be feeling obligated to actually deliver. They'll be like, uh, what are your best Pornhub videos? Send us a link. Talk about them. Uh. That's where I draw the line. There, There is things that I will talk about and there's things that I don't. I have boundaries. Audience, understand that if you're going to give us ideas. We appreciate you tuning in. We would like to mention that we do still have a Patreon. It is benefiting um, a lot of different things right now. Uh, Palestine uh, support, relief, and uh, transgender activism. Correct? Uh, it is specifically financing resources for trans people trying to escape states where being trans is criminalized. And everyone keeps talking about Project 2025 and all the terrible things it's going to do to this country. But for many minority groups, Project 2025 is already here. And so it is important that uh, we give individuals the resources to escape places that have become increasingly hostile to their existence. That's what our Patreon is supporting. Um, if you don't have money to give to our Patreon, we totally understand. But if you could give us a, a your feedback, um, give us a rating on your um, streaming platform, that would be great. We appreciate you tuning in and have a great week. We have many thanks for the use of our theme music, which is the song Drop by Ketza. You can find more of their music online at ketza.uk. You can also find Date These Guys online on Twitter and Instagram at at DateTheseGuys or visit DateTheseGuys.org. If you have questions for the podcast or want to be a wealthy sugar parent, please send an email to DateTheseGuys at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our work, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash date these guys. We have behind the scenes information, early episode access, participation in polls, and exclusive access to a guy's sibling map of date ideas for the Arizona area. Since the world sucks right now, we are currently donating all Patreon proceeds to trans organizations like Trevor Project, a trans suicide prevention organization, and moving assistance funds for those fleeing states outlawing their very existence. Please consider becoming a member and supporting our work today.